Hey everybody, this is Mr. Piercy. Today what we're going to be taking a look at is how to find the surface area of prisms and cylinders. So surface area is essentially the entire area of a three-dimensional object. So a prism by definition is going to be a polyhedron that has two congruent parallel polygons that we would consider a base. Uh, every other polygon that makes up the prism would be considered a lateral face. Generally, the lateral faces of any kind of prism are going to be rectangles of some kind. Well, all of the edges that are formed by the lateral faces would be referred to as lateral edges. The surface area, like I said, is essentially the entire area of the, enti uh, of the three dimensional object. The lateral area, however, is just the area of the rectangular faces that make up the uh, lateral faces of the prism. So go ahead and take a moment and copy this down as you need to. Uh, when you're ready, go ahead and move on. Uh, now, a net is a way of representing a three-dimensional object uh, like a prism or a cylinder or a pyramid or, or, or a cone as a two-dimensional shape. It's kind of like uh, if you take a box, imagine if you take a, a cereal box or if you take, you know, uh, a box that an Amazon package uh, arrives in and you, you break it apart so that way it'll fit into your trash can easier. Uh, if you unfolded that box, it would be what we would refer to as a geometric net. So on the left there is just, you know, some basic shapes of what nets would be. We have the rectangular prism where you can see uh, they color coded the faces so that way you can see that the opposite faces uh, where they would be in the net uh, the net of a cylinder those are the things that we're going to be looking at here you can see the net of a cylinder the lateral part of a, the lateral area of a cylinder is really going to just be this uh, rectangle here so let me pick a not a highlighter and Let's see, I think yellow should probably show up on there. Okay, so this would be the, that would be the lateral area of the uh, cylinder. This would be the lateral area of a cone. And the triangles in a pyramid would make up the lateral area of a pyramid. So every triangle or, or in a pyramid, the lateral faces are always going to be triangles, whereas in a prism, the lateral faces are always going to be uh, rectangles. So sometimes what you'll see in word problems is they'll use the, the term a right prism. And that really doesn't mean anything other than the fact that the lateral edges are just going to be perpendicular to whatever polygon is the is the base. It's basically what we think of most of the time whenever we think of as a of a prism. Uh, an oblique prism is kind of you know what you see uh, uh, in the picture on the left there. It's a, still a prism where the bases are parallel to each other but the lateral edges aren't going to be uh, perpendicular to the bases anymore. And we'll take another look specifically at oblique prisms and oblique cylinders uh, when we get to volume uh, with something called Cavalieri's principle. But uh, anyway, uh, a cylinder and a right cylinder, again, typically most cylinders, what we're going to be looking at will be considered a right cylinder. But sometimes in word problems, uh, authors of word problems feel like they need to specify. So if you see something that says a right prism or a right cylinder or a right cone, it simply means basically what you generally think of as a prism, a cylinder, or a cone. Uh, we won't really be doing too much with oblique stuff. Uh, so here, the one thing that you want to pay attention to on the diagram that you see in the cylinders is the uh, segment that would connect the two centers of the circles together. They're going to be perpendicular, so that would be the height. Whereas this one here, this segment that connects the centers of the circle, because it's not perpendicular, it can't be the height. We would refer to this as the axis of the cylinder at that point. Remember height always must be perpendicular, uh, the perpendicular distance between two objects. 
so here we're going to be looking at our first formula for uh, area or surface area of a prism. Now, you can find surface area of a prism two different ways. You can find the area of each individual face and simply add up your collective areas, like we have done previously with uh, figures that incorporated more than one shape at the same time. Uh, here, however, we're primarily going to be looking at using the formula itself. Now, the formula that we have, there's two of them here. Uh, this one is basically what we're going to be looking at. This one specifically is going to be more for uh, figures that have regular polygons as a base, like uh, a pentagon, a hexagon, nonagon, those kinds of things. If it's a rectangle, if it's a triangle, uh, those usually aren't going to be something that you would see. And, and since you know, that's specifically what I want to note the difference here. If I say, uh, take the general equation that we have, S is equal to 2 times the base. Well, if the base of a regular polygon is like a, you know, pentagon or something, I'm going to say 1 half times the apothem times the perimeter, or 1 half times the apothem times the number of sides times the length of each side. Uh, well, here, the 2 and the 1 half, that simplifies to just be 1. So that's why the other equation, oops, that equals 2. Like this. That's why it simplifies. That's why it doesn't have the 2 on that equation. Now, I want you guys to pay particular attention to the uh, example that I'm kind of giving you here. Um, make sure you include this information in your notes so that way you, you, you can refer to it later as you need to. Uh, but one of the things, surface area typically is going to be uh, a very challenging topic for some students. Uh, on standardized tests, surface areas are usually one of the lowest scored uh, topics whenever we're dealing with geometry, uh, geometric shapes. Uh, and, and a lot of it has to do with the vocabulary that's used. When we're dealing with area of objects, we've already dealt with the terms bases and heights in a lot of respects. Well, three-dimensional objects also have bases and heights. So we tend to use base and height uh, consecutively in the same problem, but they refer to different parts of the figure. Uh, and in the equations, the capital letters are referring to the shape that happens to be the base. Uh, so a capital B would be the area of the base. Capital P is the perimeter of whatever polygon is the base. Lowercase letters are referring to segments of some, some kind. So a lowercase b is referring to a segment. A capital B is referring to an area. So here, uh, I've given you a trapezoidal prism because the trapezoidal prisms really don't get seen too often, uh, but this is a good example of the words bases and heights being used multiple times for the same object but refer to different things. So the way that we start out an equation like this is we always just start with the formula itself. Surface area is 2 times the base plus the perimeter times the height. Well, in this case, the capital B represents the area of the base, which would be the uh, trapezoid. So this is the, those, these two shapes, those are the bases of the prism. So I start by replacing the capital B with the area of whatever that shape is, which is one half times the sum of the two bases times the height. Well, the perimeter of that object is gonna be the four sides added together and then, of course, multiplied by the height of the prism itself. So again, we're seeing the term base and height being used several in two different places here, but they're not referring to the same thing. The bases of the trapezoid are whatever the parallel segments are. So in this case, uh, this 5, this is a base, and this 8, that's a base of the trapezoid. And the height of the trapezoid is the perpendicular distance between them, which would be the 6. Now, in the equation here, the 2 and the 1 half, those just simplify to be 1. That's why they're not in the rest of the problem. 
so here I do have to do the Pythagorean theorem to find that this is 6.7. Uh, so that's where that 6.7 is coming from. I'm just using the Pythagorean theorem to know, because I know that this is 6, and this part of the triangle here would be 3. Uh, now the height of the base and the height of the figure are different. If you notice here I have a 6 substituted for height and then here I have a 12 substituted for height. Well here the 12 that's the height of the prism whereas the 6 is the height of the base. They're different. Okay so a lot of students do have a difficult time keeping those two things separate because they utilize the same word but are referring to different parts of the figure. So when we simplify the 5, the 8, the 6, we get 76, 78, and on the right with the perimeter times the height of the prism, we get 3084, and so overall I would say the surface area is about 386.4 square units. So again, this is just a demonstration for uh, keeping the terms base and height and whatnot uh, straight when you're working out these problems. So here we have a uh, triangular prism. Uh, they're calling it a right prism again because the bases will be perpendicular to the lateral edges. Uh, so here they're giving us the base is a, an equilateral triangle where each side is six inches. And we want to be able to find what's the surface area of this. Well, if you notice here on the left, I'm giving you some extra information because here they're saying the area of the base is one fourth times the square root of three times the side squared. Well, where did that come from? Because we're not used to saying the area of the triangle is something like that. We're used to saying the area of a triangle is one half times the base times the height. So over on the left is kind of where I'm showing you where it comes from. Uh, on the left, we have an equilateral triangle where one side is S. We don't care that it's six in this case. We just say it's some side. So the small piece, this the small side of the right triangle here, let me pick a brighter color so we can see what I'm looking at here. So here, the this side of the right triangle is half of the hypotenuse, so that's why it's S over 2. And the long leg, which is the altitude of the equilateral pier, uh, triangle, is uh, the short leg times the square root of 3. So that's where S radical 3 over 2 comes from. Well, if I substitute those values into what we normally think of, as the area of a triangle, one half base times height. Uh, if the base, the overall base, from here to here, that's S. So that's why I'm substituting a, just the single S for the base. And the height is the S radical 3 over 2. Well, if I multiply, and let's see here, if I multiply the numerators together, so the one half, the S, and the S, uh, those is just going to, or, or S radical 3, well, the S and the S give me S squared uh, and radical 3. Uh, and in the denominator, the denominators that get multiplied together, those are the, the 2 here and the 2 here. That's where the denominator of the 4 comes from in the equation. So that's where that uh, 1 fourth radical 3 S squared comes from for the area of the equilateral triangle. So now that we know where that came from, we can substitute the values. The side is 6, uh, so that gives us, when we multiply through here, uh, 9 radical 3. Well, the perimeter of the equilateral triangle is just going to be the sum of the three sides, which is 18, because they're all 6 inches long. So the height of the prism, the distance between the two triangular bases, is 8 inches. So now that we've identified all of those things, we can substitute them into the equation. Uh, the area of the base is 9 radical 3 units squared. Uh, the perimeter is 18. The height of the prism is 8. So substituting here gives us uh, overall 18 radical 3 plus 144 square inches. That would be considered the exact answer. Or about 175.2 would be considered the approximate answer in square inches. So at this point, go ahead and pause the video. Uh, and try working out the problem that you have here. The one thing that I would encourage you to try doing is here they're not giving you a diagram. I would try to draw a uh, rectangular prism just as a sketch so that way you can label things. But go ahead and work out this problem here and when you're done, 
uh, press play on the video again and check your answer and see how yours looks compared to mine. All right, so hopefully we have a good answer here. Now, uh, if, before I told you to work the problem out, I said, go ahead and try drawing a diagram of the figure. And that's always what, every time I have to work with the figure and they're not giving me a diagram, I'm gonna just sketch it out. Uh, so here uh, on the left, I'm just giving you a uh, rectangular prism and I'm showing you, uh, now the problem with rectangular prisms is that uh, every, figure, every opposite rectangle can be the base of the figure because by definition, the base of a prism is whatever polygon is opposite and congruent to uh, each other. So they're, they're gonna be parallel and congruent to each other. Well, that is every opposite rectangle in the prism. So the one that I'm choosing is I'm choosing the base of the prism to be the one that is uh, five feet by four feet. So that's the base of my prism. Remember, base does not mean that it's at the bottom necessarily. So substituting into the equation, uh, area of the base is the length times width or base times height. I, I, I went with length times width here in this case for the rectangle simply because uh, the perimeter uses length and width and I didn't want to just use base and height, base and height, base and height all the time, okay? So the length and the width, substituting here, uh, gives me four by five, and two times four plus two times five. Now remember the height of the prism is the distance between the bases. So in my case, the height is going to be 11 feet. Uh, simplifying, the uh, two times area of the base gives me 40. Uh, the perimeter times the height of the prism gives me 198, so overall, the surface area of the rectangular prism is 238 square feet. Now the one bright spot really with surface area is actually going to be prism or cylinders because uh, even though cylinders incorporate pi into the equation, uh, it's nice because the area of the, the base is always just a circle. So the area of the base is really easy to substitute, it's just pi r squared. And when we look at the, well, I'm not gonna try and make a, but here, if I were to make a net of a cylinder, so this is, you know, pi r squared, this is pi r squared, and uh, the distance between them, that's the height of the prism. And this piece here, that's the circumference, which would be, 2 pi r. So that's where the equation 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h comes from. So it may seem unusual the way the equation is written out because we're, you may or may not be used to looking at equations with pi in them. But cylinders are actually going to be much simpler to find the surface area of as opposed to prisms simply because uh, the bases are always going to be the same shape. They're always going to be circles. So let's take a look at how we use the equation. So here we have a cylinder that has a radius of four and a height of five. And those are really the only two dimensions that I care about. So substituting those things into the equation, we can say four squared uh, for the area and four and a five for the, uh, for the lateral area. Uh, and simplifying on the left, I'm gonna get 32 pi, simplifying on the right, I get 40 pi. Now, because both of those numbers are multiplied by pi, those are like terms. So I can add those together and that would be 72 pi meters squared. Stopping there is the exact surface area. And algebraically, mathematically, the work that we did, very pretty basic. So stopping right there is perfectly fine. In fact, most of the time, that's what I'm going to ask you to do. Now, the approximate area, what it's asking you to give uh, is 226.195 meters squared. So that's, uh, again, just like what we did with area of circles in general, when we look at sector area or area of the circle, we, you know, and circumference, we can just leave our answers in terms of pi. And a lot of times that's what we're gonna be expected to do. So at this point, Go ahead and try working, use that equation yourself, see if you can find the surface area of another cylinder and uh, pause the video, work this out. When you're ready, hit play and come back and compare your answer with mine. Okay, 
So hopefully we have uh, something worked out. Again, uh, because there's not a diagram given to me, I'm going to just give myself a quick sketch of a cylinder with the dimensions that they're giving me. So I have a, a height of 9 centimeters, a radius of 6 centimeters. Substituting those into the equation, I'm going to work out to be in as exact area 100 and pi or 180 pi centimeters squared or uh, about 595.5 centimeters squared for an approximate area. Now here, this is uh, going to be probably the only kind of challenge things that you're going to have for surface area, especially with cylinders, uh, is if they don't give you a dimension and you have, if they give you the surface area and you have to find one of the two dimensions, either the radius or the height. So in this example, that's what we're looking for. We're finding the height of the cylinder. They're giving us the surface area and we want to know what's the height. Now this one's going to be pretty straightforward. Because you're giving us the radius, finding the height is really easy to isolate. Substitute the radius into the two parts of the equation that you have and simplify what you can. So 2 times 2.8 squared gives you 15.68 pi. 2 times 2.8 gives you 5.6 pi times the height. So now what we're going to do is we're going to move the base figures over. So the, the 15.68, we're going to move that over through subtraction. And uh, again, because they're not like terms, we're not going to try to combine those. You can't say 198.8 minus 15.68 pi and get a number. You have to multiply by pi in this case to get the approximate value. Okay, so that's going to be about 149.5. Now that value is going to be divided by 5.6 pi. Okay, now at this point here, on your calculators, you're probably going to have something that says uh, 149.540, and then you're going to say divided by uh, 5.6 pi. In order to be able to get that 8.5 millimeters, you need to put those in parentheses on your calculator, because otherwise the calculator interprets it as 149 divided by 5.6, and then it takes that quotient and multiplies it by pi, rather than dividing 149 divided by the product of 5.6 and pi. So the height of the cylinder is about 8.5 millimeters. Now I'm going to be straight with you guys. I'm going to be up front with you guys on this one. Uh, this one is asking you to find the radius. And because the radius is a quantity that is squared, you either need to be able to factor in order to be able to solve your problem, or you need to be able to remember what the quadratic formula was. So if you remember the, how to do either of those two things, you should be OK to answer this question. Either but, if you, and if you need to look it up, look up those two things. If you have to look up one of those two, I would suggest looking up the quadratic formula. Um, but Go ahead and try working out this problem, see if you can figure out what the radius of the circle is, or radius of the cylinder is. And uh, when you're ready, hit play again and come back and compare your work with mine. Okay, so this last example here is asking you to find the radius of a cylinder as opposed to the height of a cylinder. So this one's a little bit more complicated. So they're giving you the surface area of the cylinder to be 168 pi. So they're leaving it as an exact answer, which is very helpful because at some point we have to divide by pi. Well, because the quantity that we're looking for is something squared, the radius in this case, uh, we have no choice but to either uh, use factoring or use the, excuse me, use the quadratic formula in order to be able to isolate the value of r. Because the radius is squared, technically there's going to be two answers for the quadratic equation that we essentially have here. So uh, substitute the values, 168 pi for the surface area. And, and because the quantity that we're looking for is squared, we're going to put it in standard form of a quadratic and have everything on the left side of the equal sign. So at this point right here, or on the right side of the equal sign, I should say, this is what I'm saying is the standard That's the standard form of a quadratic equation. So normally what we would say is 0 is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. 
So if I'm using the quadratic formula, we're going to say negative b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Having it in standard form allows us to substitute appropriately into the uh, quadratic formula that you see on the right, or it allows you to factor. Now, the way I elected to work out this problem is I just decided to go ahead and factor uh, the greatest common ter the greatest common factor out of the three terms that we see. So the one term, 2 pi r squared, that's the leading term. Then we have 10 pi r, that's the middle term, and then the negative 168 pi, that's what would be probably considered the constant term in the equation. Well, all of those things can be divided by 2 pi, so I'm factoring out 2 pi out of every term. So if I factor 2 pi out of the leading term, I'm just left with r squared. 2 pi away from the middle term is 5r, and if I take 2 pi away from the last, time, last term, I just have the negative 84. So now, inside of the parentheses, I have something that's a little bit easier to try and factor. I have r squared plus 5r is equal to, or minus 84. So the factors of 84 that can combine together to give me a 5 in some way would be a 7 and a 12. So if 12 is positive and 7 is negative, together when they add together, they give me the positive 5. But together when they multiply, they give me the negative 84. So the two factors that we have for the quadratic equation are the r minus 7 and the r plus 12. Those are the two factors. So the 2 pi on the left, it's not a factor because it doesn't contain the variable. It doesn't contain the r. Uh, so we don't need to set that one equal to zero. So when I solve the two factors, when I set the two factors equal to zero, I get a positive seven and a negative 12. So the solution, the radius that we're looking for is seven inches in this case. And the negative 12 is not going to be used because we can't have a radius that's a negative number. So we would classify that as, as an extraneous solution. So the last problem really was the most challenging, but uh, nothing that we haven't seen previously in other parts of uh, the curriculum. So uh, trust me, in Algebra 2, factoring is going to become second nature. Uh, you'll have to use it pretty consistently in Algebra 2 pre-cal and calculus. So uh, if you're not comfortable with factoring, look forward to getting comfortable with it. But that's about it for this lesson. Uh, keep in mind, surface area is the total area of an object. The bases are going to be different from the lateral uh, portion of the figure. Uh, we can find the lateral area simply by not including the bases. Uh, the total area is just going to be considered surface area. And uh, keep in mind, the term base and height probably will be used uh, often when you're dealing with the surface area of a prism. So keep in mind what's the base or what's like to say the height of the base or does the, the base, the polygon of the prism have bases that we need to concern ourselves with like the trapezoidal prism that I gave you as an example. Uh, but uh, if you have questions about anything that you've seen in the video or just need to ask me some general questions about surface area, by all means, let me know. Uh, you guys all know how to get in touch with me. But until next time, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching and take care.